the slideshow. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I'm Cotton Bryan, the high school director. Well, the world beyond woods has provided all kinds of advice in the past couple of weeks about speeches made at graduations. The news reporter Scott Simon on his radio show a few weeks back said that even he is asked to deliver commencement speeches at colleges. And he relayed one specific memory of a few weeks, uh, of a few years back. He says, quote, I opened a commencement speech with a few jokes about what I thought were plainly graduation cliches, such as, remember, education is a journey, not a destination. And today is the first day of the rest of your life. But several students later shook my hand to tell me how much those opening words had meant. And at that time I realized Graduations like weddings, funerals, and World Series parades are one of those days that makes cliches ring true. So let's try that out. My beloved seniors, remember, <laughs> education is a journey, not a destination. After all, today is the first day of the rest of your life. sort of works, but uh, particularly if you employ that trick of English teachers, that trick that makes us English teachers feel so good about ourselves, that is, uh, you read something more slowly than anyone deems necessary. <laughs> Seniors, today is the first day of the rest of your lives. <laughs> to my English teacher ear, it sounds pretty great. Uh, more advice on graduation speeches came uh, two weeks ago. I don't know if any of you see, uh, watch the TV sitcom Modern Family, but it includes two sisters who are nearly polar opposites. One attractive, popular, fashion conscious, the other uh, smart, nerdy, decidedly not fashion conscious. The nerdy one, Alex, is called on to deliver her middle school graduation speech. And in it, she plans to deliver a rant in which she rips her other non-studious classmates. Classmates who ignored her while she silently rose to the top, not caring about boys and skinny jeans. <laughs> when her sister, Haley, the cool one, discovers this, she urges Alex to reconsider, knowing that such a speech would be social self-sabotage. It would make her her first year of high school, miserable. Haley gives Alex her own graduation advice, that is, to use song lyrics for her speech. In the end, Alex finds herself on stage delivering a don't stop believing, hold on to that feeling. And it received, it's received with wild applause. And of course, if you add to that the English teacher trick, you get seniors, don't. Stop believing. <laughs> Hold on to that feeling. But even if graduation is a day that's ripe for cliche, and even if uh, people like to hear speakers quote song lyrics, I have a fear of what one friend refers to as being all bumper sticker and no truck. <laughs> Some meteor advice, meteor advice on graduation speeches came last week from newspaper columnist David Brooks. When Brooks surveyed many of the speeches delivered across America's college campuses this past graduation season, he concluded that graduates are sent off into the world with, quote, the whole baby boomer theology ringing in their ears, end quote. He says that in speech after speech, Graduates are told to follow your passion, chart your own course, march to the beat of your own drummer, follow your dreams and find yourself. They're given what Brooks, 
what Brooks calls the full litany of expressive individualism. And I admit, despite Brooks's criticism, that I find these to be important, even vital me messages about individuality and finding your true identity. They make me think of our time together last year in American Lit class, reading Emerson and Thoreau, two thinkers who cared a whole lot about individuality, about protecting your authentic self from the dangers of conformity. And most of us heard something in their writings that struck a deep chord. But David Brooks issues a warning in his column that has stayed in my mind the past two weeks, and I thought it was worth sending on to you for your own consideration and grappling. He says, Thank you, Devin, for that idea. David Brooks says, Today's graduates are told to find their passion and then pursue their dreams. The implication is that they should find themselves first and then go off and live their quest. But of course, very few people at age 22 or 24 or 18 can take an inward journey and come out having discovered a fully developed self. Most people don't form a self and then lead a life. Instead, they are called by a problem and the self is constructed gradually by their calling. Today's grads enter a cultural climate that preaches the self as the center of a life. But of course, as they age, they'll discover that the task of life are at the center. Fulfillment is a byproduct of how people engage their tasks and can't be pursued directly. Most of us are egotistical and most are self-concerned most of the time, but it's nonetheless true that life comes to a point in those moments when the self dissolves into a task. And Brooks concludes, the purpose in life is not to find yourself. It's to lose yourself. The purpose in life is not to find yourself. It's to lose yourself. And I guess I just get greedy in my wishes for you seniors. I want so desperately that you find your true self. And I want you to find a calling or endeavor in which you lose yourself. And of course, part of our pride in you today is that that's exactly the work you've been doing. You're living that paradox. You're engaged in that very paradox. That is, you've learned a whole lot about who you really are, and you've just started to identify things beyond the self that are perhaps greater than the self and worth committing your life to. And if this starts to sound all English teachery and a little out there, then I'll close by putting it in plainer language, language that you've heard before. That is, you've heard it before if you were listening to me at our assembly on day one of the school year. And uh, don't worry, I harbor no illusions about how little of day one of school is about listening to your director. <laughs> on that first day of school, I read from Ryan Sandberg's Baseball Hall of Fame induction speech, a speech in which Sandberg, uh, Sandberg captures this challenge of living for the self and living for something well beyond the self. In his words, quote, I was in awe every time I walked onto the field. That's respect. I was taught you never, ever disrespect your opponent or your teammate or your organization or your manager and never, ever your uniform. Make a great play, act like you've done it before. Get a big hit, look for third, the third base coach and get ready to run the bases. Hit a home run, put your head down, drop the bat, run around the bases because the name on the front of the jersey is a lot more important than the name on the back. That's respect. When did it become okay for someone to hit home runs and forget how to play the rest of the game? These guys sitting up here in the Baseball Hall of Fame did not pave the way for the rest of us 
so that players could swing for the fences every time up and forget how to move a runner over to third. It's disrespectful to them, to you, and the game of baseball that we all played growing up. Respect. A lot of people say this honor validates my career, but I didn't work for validation. I didn't play the game right because I saw a reward at the end of the tunnel. I played it right because that's what you're supposed to do. Play it right and with respect. If this validates anything, it's that guys who taught me the game did what they were supposed to do, and I did what I was supposed to do. End quote. <clears throat> My beloved seniors, I wish for you a life in which you do dedicate yourself to finding your authentic self. And my beloved seniors, I wish for your life in which you lose yourself to a great calling beyond the self. I think the hope of the world is that you do both.